grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The Word of God for our special consideration this morning is our Psalm of the Day, Psalm 145. The full text is printed in your bulletin. Sorry, 115. Dear fellow citizens of the kingdom of God, today, millions of fathers will be pretending to believe something they know is not true and for all the right reasons. They will be presented with works of art and crafts from children proudly proclaiming, look what I made for you for Father's Day all by myself. And those items will be received with matching pride and appreciation, even though those dads and the accomplice mothers, teachers, and others will know the truth. And other dads will be given ties and t-shirts and gadgets and golf balls. Their, their kids, with deep love and affection, have selected and purchased for them And those fathers know that in a few weeks, the Visa or MasterCard bill will reveal the reality of who paid and how much. On such occasions, we do not concern ourselves much with who gets the credit. Only the most damaged or twisted would fail to recognize these as exchanges of love, not transactions of commerce. But in so many other things and on so many other occasions, getting credit where credit is due us is of great importance to us, sometimes even overshadowing every other concern. Who came up with that idea that is now saving the company $300,000 a year or making it half a million? You want it known that it was you. Who was the first to post that meme on social media? You make sure it tracks back to you. Who was it who washed the dishes every day this past week? Or did the laundry when it wasn't your turn? Who picked up the tab for lunch the last three times or paid for the movie tickets? Even if we have no interest in being paid back or or evening things up, we at least want some credit for what we have done. It's human nature. And it is also mostly sinful pride. Sure, it can be important for your career to have certain things on your record and not someone else's. And when you need to be repaid, it's you need to keep track of, of whose money went for what. But the major part of our credit seeking is little more than glory seeking. Attempting to build ourselves up over against other people. Maybe for advantage, maybe for recognition, maybe just to feel better about ourselves perhaps even for the twisted pleasure of pushing someone else further down. And of course, we do the same thing spiritually. One might even argue that it is the spiritual glory-seeking that comes first and, and drives it into our relationships, our careers, and culture. We are disposed by nature to seek out and accumulate whatever credit we can to make the case that we are worthy of good things from God or providence or the universe or whatever it is we believe in for whatever kind of heaven we look forward to. In some cases, most cases, it is the things we do we expect credit for following the laws we like, being nice to people who are nice to us, not cheating, not telling big lies, giving to charity, putting a roof over our children's heads, and and so on. 
These are the things that, that, that we, we tell ourselves when we're dealing with self-doubt or, or a guilty conscience. Well, God's got to take all of this into consideration. I am actually quite a great guy when you add everything up. But alongside the claim of spiritual credit for one's good, work, one's good works and living, is the glory that we often seek for good believing. This is subtle, but dangerous. It's saying, hey, God's, God's got to like me a lot because I, I was so smart and impressive that, that I chose to offer Him my heart and believe in Him and make Him my Lord. There are Fancy theological terms we can use, Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, synergism. But what it all boils down to is the false belief that we have some natural power to approach God on our own and the wisdom to choose Him and that we deserve to be rewarded for making that decision. Now, not so many who, who think that way actually realize that's what they believe. But what it means is that ultimately they have put their confidence for their salvation in themselves for their choosing. Which means, of course, that when it comes to it, they get the credit. They get the glory. But the Holy Spirit has taught us better. The psalmist speaks for us today when he confesses, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why is it our confession that we do not deserve glory? Because we understand from both our consciences and from God's law and the Scriptures that we are sinners who sin. That we are by nature sinful and that we have disobeyed Him in our thoughts, words, and actions, having done what is evil and failed to do what is good. And as if the sinful corruption that we all inherit from our first parents were not enough, we each add evidence of our rebellion and unworthiness with our daily sins of lost tempers, lax and lazy obedience to parents, teachers, and employers, and lawmakers, loving what is of the world instead of what is of heaven, and always looking, even in our closest relationships, for our own advantage and ways to get ahead. But it is not just our active sinning that disqualifies us from approaching God's throne and claiming glory. It is also our utter incapacity for good and our inability to do what is right. We are not by nature His friends, but His enemies. We do not want just, we don't just not want to please Him. We have no desire to please Him. As sinful people, we are not neutral in the ancient conflict between the Lord and the devil. Body, heart, mind, and soul, we are thoroughly corrupted. We have no power either to do or to believe what is right or worthy of reward. And so the very idea that any of us might on his or her own choose to approach God having decided to do the things that please Him and having actually succeeded in doing such good works, having also succeeded in not doing the things that anger Him and have the Lord then say, wow, good job, let's give you a reward. Well, that is utter folly and nonsense. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot accumulate credits to exchange for God's favors or, or for mansions in paradise. But what is beyond our power is never beyond the Lord's. He can save. 
and only he can save us. Only he can save us, and only God wants to. And only God can be counted on to do so because of his mercy, because of his truth. We know this not just because he has told us so. We know it because he has showed us in the most staggering and costly way possible. The heavenly Father cared so much for this world of lost and condemned sinners that he gave his only begotten son to be not a good example or a teacher of moral wisdom, but to be the atoning sacrifice for everyone's sins. Jesus Christ, both God and man, came to seek and to save the lost, to redeem every man, woman, and child held in bondage to sin, death, and the devil. And he did it, not by gloriously commanding armies, conquering strongholds, or calling down lightning from heaven, but he did it by humbly offering his own body and blood on the cross in payment for every offense against God's holy law, to satisfy every last bit of God's righteous wrath against sin. We did not deserve for him to do this. We did not even ask for it before he did it for us. He did it because of his mercy. He did not owe us anything. He had every earthly reason to abandon his mission and leave us to the death and damnation we have earned. But he was faithful to his word and every promise to save us because of his truth. So yes, not to us, but to the Lord's name, give glory. Yet sinful man does not like this at all. The old Adam inside us all wants credit for himself and and rebels at giving it to God, even if salvation costs us nothing, as it does. And so what welcome does the Lord receive? How do the rebels respond to the glorious good news of a loving and gracious God determined to do for them what they could never do for themselves? You know, we see it all around us, from friends and neighbors, classmates and co-workers, spouses and strangers. They ignore it. They challenge it. They, They mock the gospel and its giver. They defy their deliverer. The psalmist saw it too. Why should the nations say, so where is their God now? God's Old Testament people were familiar with this mocking question. When Moses presented the Lord's demand that his people be freed from their slavery in Egypt, Pharaoh asked, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? The proud king of Assyria, who had conquered kingdom after kingdom to create his empire, besieged Jerusalem and told the people there not to trust in the Lord because no other god of any other nation had ever withstood him. And Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon not only destroyed Jerusalem, but also the temple that bore the Lord's name. But these were foolish mistakes, arrogance of the highest order. Pharaoh's magicians and idols were powerless to stop the plagues God sent. Assyria's mighty army was destroyed, and the Lord's angel of death passed through their camp, and all died. And Nebuchadnezzar's mighty empire fell almost overnight when God determined it was time for judgment, and its temples offered no protection to their idols or their worshipers. Yet this folly continues today. So many assume that God's inaction is inability, that his patience is impotence, 
or that His mercy is incompetence. And so many believers answer such ideas with silence, as though it is arrogance to speak the truth about the Almighty to those who challenge His goodness, His existence, His power. But it is precisely because all glory belongs to the Lord and not to us that we can respond to skepticism, mockery, and even honest questions with confidence and courage. Everything that we need for an answer, He gives us because all power and truth is His. The psalmist shows us how. In fact, our God is in the heavens. He does everything that pleases Him. The Lord, our loving, self-giving, gracious, merciful Creator, is not of the earth as we are and as the things we make and think and imagine are. Even as He is involved with His world, He is above and beyond all we know and experience. He is bigger and stronger and not restricted in any way by the laws and boundaries that constrain us. And what then can we say about His competition? Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have a mouth, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. They have a nose, but they do not smell. The hands, they do not even feel. Their feet, they do not even walk around. They do not even make a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. Now it is the psalmist's and our chance to challenge the idols that Israel's neighbors and enemies worshipped and that unfaithful Israelites also bowed down to were not heavenly, but were entirely earthly. They were made by human hands and had human features, but could not even do the things that humans do. They were gods trusted for blessings like rain and fertile fields, victory and battle and prosperity and peace, yet they could not even speak, see, or move. The foolishness of relying on them should have been obvious to anyone. The inevitable end of those fools will be as powerless, will be to be as powerless and doomed as their idols. But the fact that we do not often see our neighbors bowing down to Baal or Dagon or Marduk doesn't mean that no one today engages in the same kind of false and hopeless worship. Some make idols of success or prosperity, but million-dollar homes and Mercedes-Benzes cannot take away your sins or, or even listen to your prayers. Others make idols of achievement or fame, but neither medals and promotions nor clicks, likes, and retweets gain you a place in heaven, nor can they tell you, it'll all be all right. I've got the whole world in my hands when things don't go your way. And of course, we are all tempted to trust in the idol of self-righteousness, relying on our own works and goodness to get ahead, but those are always and only our own doing and unable to lift us up beyond where we already are. We can dress up idols, ancient or modern, with as much earthly glory, glitz, and gold as we want, but none of it will last because none of it is real. But when we know the truth about, the gl about glory and about God, we point ourselves and others in His direction. Israel trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The message there is clear and simple, isn't it? Whoever you are, Whatever your status, whatever calling you have from the Lord, and whatever your heritage or history, trust in the Lord. 
He can be relied on. He is your help always and your shield always against whatever evils or terrors might threaten. Always. Credit Him with the ability to be and to do all that He has promised. Give Him the glory. And in case you need further reason or motivation, our psalm gives us this affirmation. The Lord remembers us. He will bless. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, the small with the great. Notice, there are no ifs there. The Lord places no conditions on His remembering or His blessing because this is what the merciful and faithful God does for those who fear Him. He will bless them. And He has no favorites and shows no favors to the the doers of glorious works or, or those who claim special privileges. It is faith in Him that is rewarded. The small and the great are blessed together. The same Lord showers the same grace and works the same works in each believer. We see this at the cross. Jesus was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the whole world, not just of some people. There was no notice given that his blood was shed only for those who tried harder or that those of a certain class or ethnicity or level of education would would get more of his life and salvation than others. The Son of God died for all and gives his forgiveness to all without regard to the things that the children of men use to separate and to rank. And we see this also in the means of grace that God has given us. The gospel and the word, the Bible, is the same for everyone who hears or reads it. The gospel in baptism, the washing of water and the word that cleanses us of our sins and claims us for God's kingdom, is the same for the squalling infant as it is for the erudite adult. And the gospel in the Lord's Supper, Christ's own body and blood given us in the bread and wine offers forgiveness, life, and salvation to slave and free, Jew and Gentile, white collar and blue collar, male and female, young and old, all believers alike. And the grace comes to us through these things, not because of any work we do or merit we offer, but be precisely and only because of God's promise and the Holy Spirit's work. No glory to us, all to Him. And this is not only what we believe, it is what we desire for ourselves and for others. May the Lord add blessings to you, to you and to your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. Yeah. Remember, who the Lord is and what He has done and is therefore still capable of. He is not just some more powerful being that happens to exist alongside us in the universe. He is the one who made the world we know and and made all the cosmos that we do not. And speaking of heaven and earth, the heavens are heavens for the Lord, but the earth He gave to the children of Adam. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, nor any of those who go down to silence, but we are the ones who bless the Lord from now to eternity. Praise the Lord. From our initial question, who gets the glory? The psalmist finally moves to the proper follow-up. Who gives the glory? Praising God is not the heaven's concern, but the earth's, mankind's, the children of Adam. The uncreated does not need to offer honor and thanks to itself, but the created offers it to the Creator. And in the same way, it is not the dead, but the living who have this vocation of praise. Those who have been gone down to the grave are done for now, with speaking and singing. But we who still live and breathe 
gladly and generously lift up our voices to the Maker of heaven and earth, to our Rock and our Redeemer. And why would we do anything else? Why would we neglect this praise or consider it unimportant or delay it for another day? We are the ones who live a life God has given us. We are the ones who have been saved by a Savior God sent us. The ones who benefit from the blessings worked by His power, love, and wisdom. Who are comforted by the comfort that He gives us when we are troubled. Whom He strengthens when we are feeling weak. We are the ones who, as our other readings today illustrated, who grow because the Lord planted us, nourished us, and raised us up. So we, we bless the Lord and His name. We use our mouths to speak of His goodness, mercy, awesomeness, and might. And we do it now, and we do it every day, certainly not just on Sunday mornings. We do it until we are no longer on this earth. We continue into the unbounded ages and eons of paradise that were secured for us by Jesus with his suffering, death, and resurrection. And there and then we will praise him even more and even better in unending bliss, basking in the glory of the Almighty in the heavens. May it be so for all of us. Trust him your help and your shield always, and give all glory to his name. Praise the Lord. Amen. Please rise. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless in the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, be all for all time, now and to all eternity. Amen.